Yesterday it rained on Santa Pod. 10,000 people came for fire, noise and excitement. And they all knew a little rain could kill their day. A little rain would pull a cherry. But you can't do anything about the weather, isn't it? Yes, well, that is the name of the game, really. You, you can't um, guarantee the weather. It's no a risky way. business. All the time, all the time. I sweat blood sometimes. But they did have a strip dryer, an old jet engine that works like a hairdryer on the old runway. It would simply take time. Everything's ready, everyone's waiting for action. That's what happens when a double A fuel rail lays down a good number. From 0 to 100 in 0.9 of a second, a quarter of a mile in less than seven. The aim of a drag race is to get an engine to go as fast as possible, as quickly as possible, in a straight line. First you need a good burnout to make the tyres warm and sticky. They use water or Coca-Cola or even champagne to help the slicks grab the ground. For me it's something fantastic. I just want to go fast. And faster. And faster. And faster still. I'm mean, never satisfied with our runs, you know. We always come back and say, well, that was a good run, that's the best we've ever done, but how about going a bit faster, you know? What would satisfy you? World land speed record, I suppose. <laughs> you couldn't get much faster than that, could you? No. The crowd here are for speed and surprise. An A35 with a Jaguar engine. A Ford Popular able to make 150 miles an hour. An old lady's car to take your breath away. But they're not real cars at all. A fiberglass body clamped to an engine that would shake a normal car apart. Behind the track, they build a village for speed. A world of Chevys, Studies and Caddies. A drag race is like a fairground. The cars are the sideshows. A production car is a real car that's had everything possible done to it. This one's a Camaro. The engine cost 1,500 pounds, so you know why it's called the Gobbler. Every spare penny goes on the car, or the leather gear to wear inside it. Harry Corrigan, bought this for 50 pounds, but has made it into the quickest Austin Westminster in the world. It's man against machine, really. You want to prove that you can beat the machine. You can make the machine run faster than the people who designed it ever thought it would run. Proves you're good. You, you get a real buzz out of beating someone. You a bit know? odd, that, isn't it? A bit strange. I don't think so. Why can't so. you just let a car be a car? It's, it's difficult really to explain, it's just a feeling you've got in your guts, you've got to get there. You know, the old adrenaline gets going, it's competition, it's really terrific. If Harry Corrigan is at the bottom end of dragging, then Bob Phelps is at the top. He owns the track. He built the gantries, the pits and the stands, and also owns nearly all the top cars. He bought an old Battle of Britain runway and renamed it Santa Pod. Santa, after Santa Barbara in the States where it all began, the pod after the nearby village of Poddington. They call you the godfather of drag racing. Do they really? <laughs> you uh, are though, aren't you, really? I suppose I am, yes. They, they look to me for guidance as much as I can. I lose my temper pretty frequently, but uh, try to help them. You're really involved? Oh, Every, yes. Your whole life, really? Yes, you can say that. Are you in it for the love or the money? I'm afraid I've got to say now for money because uh, the whole scene of drag racing depends on Santa Pod Raceway, whether people like it or not. That is where the money comes from to keep the sport going. And it's an expensive business. Every time a top dragster runs, it costs around £300. It burns nitromethane, at 13 pounds a gallon. 
One race uses eight gallons. That's 32 gallons to the mile. A gearbox is 2,000 pounds. An engine, 12,000. And the tires only last seven miles. What's that moment when you push your foot down on the accelerator and you're, what, at 100 miles an hour in less than a second, like? Um, that is very difficult to explain to anyone that's never been in one. Because um, it's not like nothing else, you know, it's not like no other car. But a similar sensation to going down the big dip of a big dipper, you know, the biggest dip, um, for a quarter of a mile. How many horsepower is it? It's um, just over 2,000 brake. Doesn't get you psychologically, all that power? No. no. Running away with you? No, uh, no. Um, I'm driving the car, the car's not driving me. Why is it called Man Eater? Because mm, my competition are mainly men. In fact, in this country, they're all men. So um, that's why it's a little dig, really. You're the Man Eater? I'm the Man Eater. Do you see yourself that way? Um, when I'm in this car, yeah. You do? I've got to, haven't I? To, I've got to have the right sort of attitude to win. Ross Pryor is expected to win, but Harry Corrigan is not. It might be the fastest Westminster in the world, but it's matched against a killer car, a consistent and very unusual Cortina. As expected, the Cortina wins. Harry is out. He'd come all this way, spent 40 pounds for one race. It just wasn't Harry's day. But for Roz, several thousand pounds are at stake. Roz, how do you feel? You can't talk. The bounce broken. Lifetimes are dedicated, marriages are ruined, bank managers begged, all for speed. What does your wife think of this? Uh, doesn't really come into it in actual fact. What uh, comes first? Drag racing. Every time? Yes. There's so many people depending on me now. Not a good day, was it, Harry? Nice. The bastard distributor's playing up. I'll have to see if I can uh, get a replacement from someone in the pits, probably. And you only had the one run after all that, too? One race, yeah. Two, two practices this morning. Is it really worth it? If you ask me that now, no. <laughs> Come back next meeting. You'll be back? Oh, I'll be back, yeah. They don't get rid of me that easily. <laughs> 